Bom dia. A Fundação Alexandre de Gusmão tem a honra de receber hoje para uma palestra o professor Yorisumi Watanabe para tratar dos seguintes temas, da estratégia econômica do Japão nestes tempos atribulados em que estamos atravessando e das relações entre o Japão e o Brasil e também como aprimorar a parceria entre o Japão e o Mercosul. Antes de mais nada, eu gostaria de passar a palavra para o embaixador Hayashi Teji, para ouvirmos suas palavras de saudação. Ambassador Hayashi, good morning. You have the floor. Uh, bom dia. Uh, good morning, uh, senhoras e senhores. Uh, so, Hayashi Teji, embaixador do Japão no Brasil. Uh, thank you for attending today's online seminar with Professor Watanabe Yorizumi from Kansai University of International Study in Japan. Uh, co-organized by the Embassy of Japan and the Alexander uh, Gustav, uh, Guzman Fundação. Uh, we would like to express first my gratitude to the President of the uh, Alexandre de Guzmão Fundação, uh, uh, Mrs. Marcia Lodeiro, and everyone uh, engaged in this uh, uh, seminar. Uh, Professor Watanabe Yorizumi is an expert in international economics and was the chief negotiator of Japan's first free, uh, substantive first free trade agreement with Mexico. He's, uh, he's at the uh, forefront of Japan FTA strategy and in, is a leading expert in the field of economic partnerships. I myself have also engaged in the uh, past FTA negotiation as a negotiator uh, for the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, TPP, and the Japan-EU uh, FTA. At that time, I got a lot of advice from uh, Professor Watanabe based on his vast experience. The EPA between Japan and Mexico came into force in 2005, followed by the TPP. And the uh, bilateral economic relations between the two countries have developed remarkably. For example, the number of Japanese companies operating in Mexico today uh, has increased to 1,400 more than double of the Japanese companies operating in Brazil. Looking at the current relationship between Japan and Brazil, the two countries enjoy good relations as a strategic global partner that share fundamental values such as freedom, human rights, democracy, market economy, and the rule of law. In the economic field, uh, Japan has contributed to Brazil's development through national projects or mega projects, such as the steel mill Ujiminas and the development of the Cerrado, followed by strong private sector's investment in Brazil. Oh, okay. uh, Brazil's main export are mineral resources, such as iron ore and the uh, food products, such as chicken, soybeans, and a coffee, while Japan's main export to Brazil are machinery and auto parts. In addition, there are several bilateral dialogues between our two governments, such as the Joint Economic Commission, the Infrastructure Meeting, and the Joint Scientific and Technolo Technological Commission. However, as a previous comparison with Japan-Mexico relation shows, there is still room for further development in the economic relation between Japan and Brazil. Today, Professor Watanabe will talk to, talk to us about the current situation of the world economy, including the Asia-Pacific region, as well as the strengthening uh, of relations between Japan and Brazil. I'd like to conclude my speech uh, by expressing my expectation that his, his lecture will serve as an opportunity to consider the nature of economic cooperation and partnership between Japan and Brazil, and also to further deepen the relationship 
between the two countries. Thank you. Muito obrigado. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I would like now to introduce our guest speaker today. Professor Yurisumi Watanabe is Professor of International Political Economy and Dean at the School of International Communication, Kansai University of International Studies since April 19, 2019, and also Emeritus Professor at Keio University, where he taught from April 2005 to March to the 2019. His distinguished career has featured significant engagement in the major bilateral and multilateral trade negotiations in which Japan has been involved in the past two decades. These include postings to Japan's diplomatic missions in Geneva from 1985 to 1990 and Brussels uh, 1995 to uh, 1998. He was Deputy Director General of the Economic Affairs Bureau, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan from 2002 to 2004, and served as Chief Negotiator for the Japan-Mexico Economic Partnership Agreement, IPA, and working party on Russia accession to the WTO. He was a special assistant to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Japan in 2004. He has been a member of some task forces, such as the one on the Japan-EU EPA, as well as on the Japan-India EPA, and more recently on Japan-US economic relations under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan in 2016. Professor Watanabe actually serves on the panel on Brexit issues organized by the Kendaren, the Japanese Federation of Economic Organizations. Since April 2015, <clears throat> Professor Watanabe has been statutory auditor at Mitsubishi Fuso Truck and Bus Company which is affiliated to Daimler. Today, Professor will lecture us about those important, important issues, Japan's trade strategy in troubled world markets and the Japan-Latin American relations in hazing Japan-Mercosur economic partnership. Professor Watanabe, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. You have the floor. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope... Uh, you can hear me. Um, uh, it's uh, indeed a great honor and pleasure for me uh, to be invited to uh, speak at uh, a very prestigious uh, foundation, uh, Fondation uh, de Alessandro uh, Guzman, uh, which is very well known all over the world as a uh, top uh, diplomatic institute. And uh, I had uh, uh, previous uh, occasions uh, maybe three times, uh, four times, I would think, uh, I have been to uh, your place. But because of this uh, pandemic, uh, we have been uh, in a difficult situation, uh, not being able to uh, come to see you uh, in person to person, face to face. Uh, but this modern technology of uh, uh, online conference, uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, keeps me uh, uh, quite close and closer to you, it's a great uh, pleasure for me to uh, appearing uh, at the uh, conference organized by or co-organized by Fondation and uh, also uh, Japanese embassy there. Um, yes, uh, let me uh, talk about uh, this um, uh, issue, uh, uh, several issues. Um, first of all, I should like to start uh, with the in introduction, and I'd like to uh, revisit uh, several uh, major sources of uncertainties, and that will be followed by uh, how Japan, you know, has been dealing with uh, the economic issues, particularly in the field of international trade and investment, uh, how we started, and uh, how this uh, uh, economic architecture has been developed 
uh, and have been developed further into the mega free trade agreements, uh, such as TPP or Japan EU EPA and so forth. And uh, thirdly, I'd like to uh, uh, mention about Japanese proactive approach in order to uh, uh, fight against uh, the major sources of uncertainties, uh, difficulties all over the world. And uh, I'd like to share uh, with our colleagues from Brazil and also uh, uh, other parts of the world uh, to um, uh, make the better sort of uh, uh, multilateral uh, trading system. Uh, and, and by conclusion, uh, concluding, uh, I should like to uh, revisit uh, several uh, important, important points. So uh, having said that, uh, let me uh, move on to the first uh, part, uh, that is introduction, uh, which could be a little bit uh, uh, lengthy um, uh, because I have to uh, uh, speak about uh, several uh, issues such as uh, uh, pervading uh, protectionism uh, or uh, America first type of uh, uh, trade policies uh, presented by uh, ex-president Mr. Trump. Uh, and also we had the difficulties, uh, we ha you have the difficulties particularly dealing with uh, the uh, United Kingdom withdrawal from uh, European Union that uh, uh, was a quite upsetting uh, sort of element uh, for Japanese companies. And of course, uh, coronavirus, uh, we have been uh, uh, to uh, briefly touch upon that. And then uh, uh, most recently we have the Ukraine. And uh, it has certainly uh, a lot of implications uh, for Japan's security. Uh, Japan is very uh, maybe uh, by uh, airplanes, uh, it would take, uh, uh, say, 10 to 11 hours uh, to reach that place. So uh, we are quite distant uh, sort of uh, uh, country from Ukraine. But uh, we have uh, Russian Federation, some geopolitical uh, uh, implications. Uh, stemming out from uh, this uh, problem and war in Ukraine. So uh, I'd like to also touch upon that. So those are the things uh, that I'd like to uh, deal with in this uh, introductory part. So uh, first I'd like to talk about two of the uh, pre-COVID-19, pre-corona uh, uh, issues, uh, two major sources, uh, I would put it, uh, two major sources of uncertainty. One is Brexit, and uh, this is the front page of the Financial Times on the 20, uh, uh, 25th uh, of, uh, uh, of June uh, 2016, right after the referendum, which came out with a very shocking sort of news that uh, Britain would be uh, going out uh, from uh, European Union. And uh, uh, Mr. Cameron saying almost, oops, you see, there is a big surprise. And it was a surprise to all the rest of the world, uh, including Japan. And I'd like to explain why it was so important issue for Japan. Uh, the other is uh, another front page of Financial Times. Uh, Trump puts protectionism at the heart of US economic policy. Um, it was uh, quite... Uh, also disturbing uh, effect for the international business. Um, first of all, Mr. Trump's uh, uh, protectionist uh, sort of uh, uh, tendency, uh, first uh, uh, symptom was uh, uh, Mr. Trump. Uh, he uh, honored his own uh, promise during his election campaign. Uh, that was uh, withdrawal of the United States uh, from the TPP. And he did it on the January 23rd, uh, only just two days, three days after his uh, inaugurations in 2017. So United States uh, was no longer uh, there in the uh, uh, TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And uh, um, 
when Mr. Obama was running uh, this uh, uh, negotiation on TPP, uh, Madame Hillary Clinton uh, herself mentioned that uh, the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, is a golden standard uh, for trade for the rest of the 21st century. Um, so you see the uh, United States uh, withdrew it, uh, itself from this uh, golden standard of uh, trade and investment rules. And uh, late uh, Senator, the veteran Senator uh, John McCain mentioned that that was a serious mistake. And he said that it would create an opening for China to rewrite the economic rules at the expense of American workers. And it will, and it did actually, uh, send a troubling signal uh, on America's disengagement in the Asia Pacific region at a time that the United States is very much needed. And also uh, NAFTA was very unpopular to uh, uh, Mr. Trump's uh, administration and uh, uh, that uh, hit also Mexico, but not only Mexico because uh, they uh, dealt with uh, all the issues such as rules of origin, uh, which had been uh, stipulated in NAFTA, and on which the Japanese and European Union industries had been working on. So uh, it was a big disruption uh, for the uh, uh, both Japan and uh, uh, European, uh, Japanese and European uh, industries who have been actually actively involved and engaged in the local production in the United States and taking advantage of the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, seamless uh, connection of uh, uh, NAFTA. As you know, NAFTA is now transformed into USMCA, United States, Mexico, Canada agreement. And uh, interestingly enough, there is no F in it. Uh, in NAFTA, we have FDA, but in USMCA, we have no F free is missing, you see. So USMCA, if you look at uh, the details in the rules of origin, for instance, uh, it is more stringent, it is more protectionist. Uh, so USMCA, I would conclude uh, that uh, it's more trade managing uh, agreement, managed trade agreement, or uh, it's not at all uh, free trade agreement. But fortunately, uh, some NAFTA elements still kept intact and uh, uh, Japanese companies uh, try to establish new sort of uh, uh, way out uh, to cope with this, uh, you know, the change in the rules, uh, such as in the rules of origin and others. Germany has been also suffering from uh, uh, this uh, uh, Trump administration's attitude towards uh, bilateral trade with the European Union. And Germany uh, has been really targeted as uh, the main culprit uh, of uh, producing a lot of uh, uh, trade surpluses uh, in the trade with the United States. And uh, 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 Peter Navarro, the, uh, he was the uh, economic advisor to uh, Mr. Trump. He mentioned that uh, uh, it, is it is Germany who really uh, exploit uh, the U.S. and uh, its partners. Navarro once said uh, Germany was one of the main barriers to a U.S. trade deal uh, and talks uh, with the EU known as TTIP, TTIP uh, being declared dead. So that was the situation. And another, uh, another uh, characteristics of Mr. Trump's trade policy, there was a bilateralism, bilateral trade deals that he respected more than multilateral trade deals. So he went on uh, negotiating with um, uh, uh, all those countries, particularly those uh, who are making a lot of uh, uh, trade surpluses, uh, mainly China, of course, but not only China, uh, with Japan, with Mexico, with uh, EU, um, the, the the uh, uh, Trump administration tried to uh, make bilateral deals. And uh, those deals could impl imply the balancing trade account uh, via, uh, via political uh, interventions by governments. And uh, uh, as it was the case uh, in the uh, earlier Japan-US uh, trade frictions in the 1980s and the 1990s, 
early part of the 1990s, the numerical targets to be established, for instance, in the area of auto imports. And until uh, reciprocity will be achieved, uh, this numerical targets will stay, it will dictate uh, the bilateral trade. So it's also uh, it's a kind of managed trade uh, approach. And this has been uh, reinvested in uh, uh, Mr. Trump's administration. And this is what we uh, call procedural protectionism. And uh, that was uh, quite prevailing in the 1980s uh, by way of uh, the very famous Section 301 or Super Section 301 for IPRs. The unilateral sort of measures have been uh, uh, quite um, prevailing. And, uh, uh, well, they disregard the fact that uh, those uh, procedural protectionism or unilateral measures or sanctions were uh, completely inconsistent with WTO. So we had a lot of difficulties under uh, Mr. Trump's administration. And it is interesting, uh, although you see the Mr. Biden came to power um, in uh, 2021 and uh, uh, we all expected that U.S. will change its uh, course of trade policies uh, and uh, they would become less uh, protectionist. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, contrary to our expectations, uh, Mr. Biden's uh, government uh, remained more or less the same uh, level of uh, trade protections. So uh, uh, I would say that Mr. Biden uh, seems to be taking advantage of his predecessor's uh, legacy uh, in the trade matters. Of course, Mr. Biden did a lot of good things like, uh, uh, you know, the Paris uh, Agreement, uh, Paris Accord on uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, now United States is back. And also U.S. has been uh, working hard uh, in the uh, Iran uh, nuclear deal. So a uh, uh, number of things, uh, uh, Mr. Biden has been changing uh, the course uh, of trade, uh, of the environment policies and other things. Uh, but unfortunately, in the trade area, uh, not so much uh, change has been uh, introduced. Um, Next slide, uh, it's, uh, uh, it is showing the United Kingdom, and uh, this is uh, about the Brexit. Of course, the Brexit has been already done, and uh, as of uh, January 31st uh, last year, uh, UK is formally out of European Union. Um, but uh, all the way since uh, national referendum uh, taken place in June uh, 2016, a lot of... Uh, uh, ramifications, uh, adverse effects have been uh, channeling on the uh, uh, external uh, trade uh, as well as internal trade uh, of the United Kingdom as well as uh, of the European Union. Why Brexit matters? Why Brexit, Brexit matters to Japan? Uh, because as you see, those companies that I listed uh, from Toyota on the top to Sony, Nissan, Canon, Hitachi, Toshiba, Rico, uh, those big names, as uh, you all know, uh, be it uh, automotive companies or electronics, uh, electronic appliances, uh, copy machines, uh, even uh, uh, medical devices, uh, or Takeda Pharmaceuticals is a pharmaceutical company. As you see, uh, a lot of uh, investment has been done uh, and a lot of British uh, people have been employed by those companies. And um, uh, in the case of Toyota, uh, well about 70%, uh, 75% of the UK production has been exported from uh, uh, UK to the continental uh, EU uh, member states. And also, even in the case of Nissan, uh, 80% or more of the UK production has been um, exported to uh, the continental side of the European Union. Why is that? Because uh, when they are the, uh, when the UK was member to European Union, um, those products, those Japanese products uh, made in UK uh, could be considered as a UK product so that they could avoid the imposition of uh, 
very high duties. Uh, for instance, in the case of uh, automotives, it's 10%. Uh, you know, those uh, cars coming from uh, uh, third countries and entering into European Union, it's 10%. And in the case of uh, uh, Prasuma TV, uh, 16% uh, of duties will be imposed. So in order to avoid this, the, those Japanese companies uh, invested uh, massively in the uh, UK, particularly in England, as you see, and also some part of Wales. And um, this has been working well. And that was uh, when Mr. Thatcher, Madame Madame Thatcher was uh, the Prime Minister of the UK. Uh, so in the mid of 1980s, uh, you know, the Japanese companies had been quite uh, well presented there. And, uh, uh, well, they took, uh, uh, you know, uh, took for granted that uh, this kind of situation will, uh, will be uh, forever. But it was not uh, because of the Brexit. And unless uh, EU and the UK would have a uh, free trade agreement uh, or similar kind of agreement, uh, it could be very disruptive, uh, very uh, disturbing uh, effect on Japanese companies. But now it's uh, more or less uh, under control because uh, uh, UK and the EU had a free trade agreement. But um, since UK is out of the European Union, uh, there is a border uh, measures or border controls uh, when the goods uh, passing uh, the border are entering into UK or the other way around. Uh, there's a, a customs uh, procedures that they have to respect and uh, it takes time. Uh, it also, uh, you know, the transaction cost would be added on. So uh, I think it is no longer the same as uh, the situation it used to be. Uh, UK, uh, when UK was uh, a member to uh, uh, European Union. So it was a great sort of uh, mm, embarrassment for Japanese companies and uh, causing a lot of uh, uh, problems. Uh, in that sense, there was also uh, quite uh, heavy uh, sort of uncertainty. Uh, now, United, United Kingdom uh, has uh, the uh, uh, free trade agreement with European Union. Uh, uh, but they established their own uh, national tariff schedule. Uh, and on that basis, uh, they negotiated uh, Japan-UK uh, uh, bilateral economic partnership agreement, uh, which is uh, Japanese FTA. So uh, now UK has uh, uh, bilateral EPA with Japan and U UK is also quite interestingly enough, uh, UK is thinking of joining uh, the Trans-Pacific uh, partnership as a part of their uh, Global Britain uh, type of uh, program. So anyway, um, it is now more or less uh, under control, I, I said, uh, as I said, but at the same time, there's still some uh, uh, border adjustment, uh, border control, and uh, resulting uh, in the uh, transaction cost increase. Japanese companies, uh, particularly in the auto companies, uh, they are very active uh, in Europe. As you see, uh, many, many uh, Japanese uh, plants, uh, 13 plants in eight countries, including UK. Uh, for research and development, uh, 12 uh, centers of uh, research uh, and development in five countries, and employing uh, 150, almost 1,000, 150,000 people. Uh, so, uh, and also it's quite significant amount of uh, purchase of uh, EU parts made in EU. Uh, so um, the Japanese companies have been quite uh, active in uh, uh, local production in their respective countries, not only completed vehicles, but also those parts and components. And uh, uh, the, the area has been not only in the western part of Europe, but also it is gradually moving towards the east uh, into the new uh, member states of uh, European Union, uh, such as uh, Czech Republic, Poland, uh, Hungary, uh, and so forth. So uh, uh, the Japan-EU relations are very, very important. So in that uh, in that light, uh, I would say that the very fact that we have now bilateral EPA 
uh, between Japan and the UK, that has a significant uh, sort of uh, uh, effect because uh, uh, European Union, Japan put together, it accounts uh, slightly more than 30% of total GDP and also uh, about one third of uh, world trade. So um, uh, it is uh, one of the uh, largest uh, EPA uh, in the world. Now, uh, let us turn to uh, Corona things. Um, the, the diagram that I'm showing you is uh, the effects of Corona, Corona effects on the uh, global value chain. And uh, uh, this uh, is a diagram that I borrowed from uh, JETRO, Japan External Trade Organization. They used uh, this interesting uh, index called the Global Supply Chain Pressure Index. And uh, they use uh, statistics such as uh, uh, Baltic uh, Maritime uh, Transportation uh, Index and uh, also uh, the uh, procurement uh, officials uh, index uh, or manufacturing uh, sector index and so forth, uh, about 27 uh, different indices. Um, on the basis of that, they, they made this. And uh, uh, you see a couple of peaks. And uh, the first peak that appeared to us is uh, the one on the uh, April 2011, that is following uh, Great uh, East Japan earthquake, uh, earthquake that also produced a huge tsunami and uh, roughly 22,000 Japanese passed away because of that earthquake and tsunami. And uh, that had a very significant uh, negative effect uh, and pressurized very much. Uh, so you, you see the, that's one of the highest uh, uh, peak uh, that is following this uh, March 2011, uh, the big earthquake uh, in Japan and following subsequent uh, the disruption of the global value chain. And then we had some zigzag movement. Uh, the next peak uh, is uh, in 2017 also uh, from April 2017 up to December 2017, uh, there's a gradual, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uptrend. That is uh, Mr. Trump's, uh, you know, policies uh, and uh, uh, declaring the uh, uh, bilateral deals uh, to be uh, prioritized. Um, then we have uh, uh, some sort of, uh, uh, again, some zigzags and then uh, uh, some improvements there uh, around April 2019. Uh, then we have sharp increase uh, to reach the next uh, highest peak. And uh, that is certainly uh, because of Corona thing. Uh, starting from the early part of 2020. I remember it was uh, uh, in March 2020 when I visited uh, Brasilia uh, and other parts of uh, Brazil, uh, such as Curitiba, and I was quite impressed by the uh, industrial development there and how Japan, uh, Japanese companies are involved in there. Uh, my uh, present university is located in Kobe, Hyogo Prefecture, and Hyogo Prefecture is very active in Kurichiba, and I visited uh, uh, those factories. And uh, in the nearby avenue, a lot of uh, quite heavy uh, sort of uh, uh, traffic of lorries and trucks. I was quite impressed by that. Um, so that was in March 2020. Uh, that's the uh, sort of beginning of the uh, uh, pandemic. It was uh, 17th March 2020, I remember, the WHO, World Health Organization, declared that uh, COVID-19 is a pandemic, you see. And then we had uh, uh, some, you know, easing uh, sort of tendency there. And again, now uh, we are having, uh, you know, because of this Omicron, 
uh, we have uh, a very steep uh, and sharp uh, curving up and uh, uh, the highest one so far uh, is uh, October 21st. Uh, that is uh, the highest, but of course, maybe uh, this is be before the uh, uh, invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia. So maybe this uh, uh, global supply chain pressure index uh, again marked another uh, highest peaks uh, following this uh, Russian intervention in, uh, uh, in Ukraine. So GVC has been largely uh, disrupted and uh, uh, the entire uh, global value chain or production network has been in uh, jeopardy since then. So, you know, world economy has been very much troubled. Uh, first, uh, uh, Trump, uh, Trumpian or Trump type of uh, uh, America first uh, type of protectionism and uh, uh, US China uh, trade frictions, uh, uh, then we have Corona and now we have Ukraine. So um, the next slide I'm showing you uh, that in the uh, post COVID-19 era that we are living now, the, some concerns around trade uh, being qualitatively uh, different uh, from uh, the uh, previous uh, occasions, previous uh, uh, situation. Uh, first of all, uh, all the countries, uh, now we are thinking of uh, economic security. Economic security is, uh, uh, is a new uh, kind of issue. Of course, it has been always, uh, always there. For instance, uh, in the, in the GATT, uh, GATT 21, uh, that is an um, uh, exception clause for uh, national security reasons. And usually all kinds of uh, investment or trade uh, agreements, we have that kind of uh, security exceptions. So security has been always there, but uh, uh, now it has been very, uh, you know, uh, severely uh, felt uh, by all the uh, policymakers in uh, all parts of the world, I think, uh, including Japan and Brazil. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, semiconductor shortage uh, adversely affecting auto production worldwide, um, in addition to corona things, and uh, uh, rare metal scarcity, uh, particularly in the case of production of uh, uh, economic vehicles, and uh, um, particularly in the context of Japan, uh, sorry, uh, in the context of US-China uh, trade, uh, trade row, uh, trade frictions, the tightened export control uh, on both sides, uh, that result in uh, short supply uh, in the importing countries. And uh, in the case of US, for instance, uh, the 150 firms listed in relation to Huawei, uh, what they call entity list, and also denied person list, um, verified list, and so forth. So this is the uh, uh, new type of uh, uh, trade uh, barriers uh, on the basis of uh, security issues. So we have to uh, prepare for this kind of situation. And uh, in the case of Japan, uh, the present session, the current session of the diet, uh, Japanese parliament, uh, the uh, uh, lawmakers are discussing about uh, the uh, economic security law. Uh, so a lot of discussions going on and uh, we are very curious uh, what kind of uh, uh, economic security law will come out. Uh, you know, so it is, uh, it's a concern, uh, national concern uh, to uh, quite uh, many countries including Japan and certainly uh, for Brazil. Uh, second point is uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, carbon neutrality uh, is um, also quite important. And uh, information disclosure uh, via CDP, CDP stands for Carbon Disclosure Project. And uh, 9,600 companies or more have uh, been disclosed in 2020. Uh, greenhouse gas, GHG, 
uh, reduction of GHG uh, is really uh, quite uh, imperative to get uh, the normal uh, transactions in goods and services. Carbon tax to prevent uh, carbon leakage. And the EU is forefront of that uh, thing. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, EU is going to introduce carbon tax system as of uh, uh, January 2023. And that raising uh, that is raising the concerns elsewhere in relation to WTO rules, a poss possible breach to WTO rules. For instance, uh, Keidan Ren, Japanese uh, uh, big industry federation, Keidan Ren, uh, has already expressed its concern over a uh, carbon tax system. Uh, so, uh, if uh, EU uh, goes on straightforward, and if they unilaterally impose this, then that will create another uh, problem for the world trading system embodied in the WTO. The third issue is human rights or labor issue, labor standard issue, if you like. And uh, uh, there's a linkage being established, a uh, linkage between human rights and external trade, external economic policies. And uh, uh, already some Japanese companies, such as Uniqlo, uh, their uh, products uh, allegedly uh, using the cotton uh, fiber uh, produced in uh, 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 in the uh, Uyghur area, Uyghur area of China, the Islamic part uh, of uh, China, the Uyghurs. Um, so, uh, because of the uh, Chinese government uh, uh, policy, uh, giving um, uh, harsh treatment, uh, discriminatory treatment to uh, Uyghurs. Uh, the uh, uh, American uh, market, as well as uh, European Union markets, have been uh, closed for those products using uh, the products coming from uh, Uyghur area, Xinjiang Uyghur area. So, uh, you know, now uh, Japanese companies have to think about uh, that kind of uh, ramifications uh, stemming out from a human rights issue or labor issue. Uh, forced labor, slavery, child labor, harassment, all these things uh, would be subject to sanctions, uh, sanctions against human rights. Uh, so um, uh, now uh, those companies have to uh, look up very closely the due diligence uh, to protect human rights. Otherwise, they cannot enjoy their uh, trade as free as uh, it used to be. So those issues, economic security, carbon neutrality, and human rights labor, those are the, the concerns that we, ha we have to uh, take into consideration when we are conducting uh, trade, investment, and other economic, external economic policies. So um, with all these uh, background, how Japan has been active. Uh, first, I'd like to see the kind of basic uh, sort of structure of uh, Japanese trade policy uh, using, uh, you know, the FDA EPA as a kind of instrument. But the main feature here uh, already I'd like to uh, share with you that is uh, uh, East Asian integration is uh, rather different from uh, uh, economic integration in Europe. Uh, economic integration in Europe, they started with uh, creating, uh, you know, the uh, uh, IGC, Intergovernmental Conference. And uh, uh, in the Intergovernmental Conference, they uh, negotiated uh, those treaties, such as uh, Treaty of Rome, or most, most recently, it's the Treaty of Lisbon, uh, to, to uh, use as a kind of legal base for further forging those countries into uh, economic integration. Uh, so I would say that the European Union uh, or European integration uh, to be described as uh, de jure, uh, institution-driven integration. Uh, they established um, uh, on the basis of Treaty of Rome or Treaty of Maastricht, uh, they have uh, the institutions such as 
uh, European Commission as a kind of uh, government for all the EU uh, countries. Um, and uh, uh, they have also council of ministers uh, representing uh, each of those member states' uh, national interest and coordinating the national interest of all member states. Uh, that is a role played by the uh, Council of Ministers and the highest Council of Ministers is Council, uh, European Council that's known as European Summit. And they have also the uh, um, European uh, Court of Justice uh, to deliver the legal interpretations and findings uh, to the disputes. Uh, between countries, between country and uh, individuals, or between individuals and so forth. So the, uh, the, those are the institutions which has, which has been supporting the movement of European integration. But in East Asia, we didn't have uh, that kind of thing at all. Uh, we didn't start with IGC, intergovernmental conferences. It, what, uh, with what we started? That we started with the uh, foreign direct investment and uh, resulting the uh, uh, local productions uh, and uh, those products being uh, traded uh, across the national boundaries. Uh, so that was the, uh, uh, in East Asia. So, you know, the, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the slide that I want to uh, share with you. Um, Japanese car industries, uh, you know, they established gradually the optimal supply system in East Asia. Uh, after the Praza Accord. The Praza Accord was uh, the very important uh, turning point for Japan's industrial development. Praza Accord was uh, the uh, accord by G5 countries, the uh, five uh, most industrialized countries get together, uh, their uh, financial ministers and also their heads of the central banks uh, get together from time to time. And uh, in uh, September 85, they uh, got together at the Plaza Hotel in New York. That's why the agreement reached there is named after the hotel, uh, the Plaza Accord. And uh, prior to Plaza Accord, the Japanese yen was something like uh, 220 yen to one data. Uh, then gradually uh, after the Plaza Accord, it reached the point of 180. Uh, uh, yen to one dollar. Uh, those uh, couple of days, uh, the Japanese yen has been a little bit weakened, and uh, I think uh, the present exchange rate is something like 120, between 120 and 123 uh, per uh, US dollars. But anyway, uh, so, uh, you saw, you know, the Praza Accord was uh, um, the accord in which the uh, Japanese yen to be uh, more appreciated and the yen, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, dollar has been depreciated. So uh, about 20%, 25% of appreciation of Japanese yen put uh, the uh, very difficult situation with Japanese companies because if they, product, uh, if they produce all the products in Japan, uh, that entail in the sharp rise in their prices in the overseas market, and that would result in the loss of market competitivity. So in order to avoid that kind of negative effects of appreciated Japanese yen, the many companies, particularly those parts and components companies in the automotive industry, they decided to go out from uh, Japan to neighboring uh, ASEAN countries, such as Thailand, Malaysia, uh, Philippines, Indonesia, and so forth. And uh, each of those countries, uh, a few specific uh, parts and components have been uh, produced, like diesel engine in Thailand, air conditioning, uh, uh, those are in Thailand, and uh, some engine parts, condensers uh, made in Malaysia, likewise, uh, transmission, combination meters, uh, those are in the Philippines. Uh, so you see the uh, different uh, countries, uh, you know, the, the choosing different countries for the uh, optimal sort of supply uh, chain. And uh, those uh, parts and components being uh, traded, being exported and imported, uh, and um, uh, 
final uh, sort of uh, uh, assembly being made in Thailand, uh, while uh, very important high value added uh, engine parts and components are uh, still uh, to be exported from Japan uh, to be uh, imported into those countries, particularly to Thailand. So, for instance, uh, one Nissan car, like uh, the smallest uh, subcompact car called March, uh, March is no longer produced in Japan, but it produced in uh, ASEAN countries uh, and assembled in Thailand and exported and shipped from Thailand to uh, to Japan. So, you see, this is the kind of de facto uh, FDI-driven uh, integration. And, you know, the companies, uh, they uh, had a concern that those uh, uh, de facto uh, network uh, should be further uh, consolidated by uh, legal instruments such as free trade agreement. And uh, uh, they uh, put the pressure on Japanese government uh, to uh, work on uh, negotiations uh, or negotiating uh, FDA, EPA with those countries. So that was the beginning of the, uh, you know, the what I would call de facto business-driven integration. So marketing integration in Asia Pacific, in uh, uh, summing up, the Praza Accord was a ignition key, and uh, de facto business-driven integration through FDI, establishing supply chain, and production networks in the region. And uh, uh, those FDA EPAs uh, to consolidate the merits of de facto integration. And it started with bilateral EPAs like uh, uh, EPA uh, between Japan and, the Fili uh, and uh, Singapore, uh, fo followed by Japan and Malaysia, Japan and Indonesia, Japan and Thailand, and so forth. So um, bilateral EPAs uh, have been uh, negotiated, and in addition, uh, some wider uh, regional uh, FDA APAs, such as ASEAN Plus 3, uh, that is ASEAN Plus Japan, China, Korea, that was uh, China's proposal made in 2004. Uh, Japan could uh, go along with this Chinese proposal of ASEAN Plus 3 as an East Asia FDA. But Japan has certain considerations that if it's ASEAN 3 takes the shape of East Asian uh, FDA, then you see China would be uh, too much, uh, maybe too much preponderant. Uh, so Japan thought that uh, bringing in other countries such as Australia, New Zealand would be very beneficial because they are very mature democratic countries. And also India, uh, you know, India is also emerging economy with a large population. So uh, uh, Japan uh, walked out, bringing uh, in India into the framework of ASEAN plus three. So ASEAN plus three plus additional three, namely Australia, New Zealand, and India. So that is ASEAN plus six. Then that was the Japan's proposal in 2006. Well, many uh, observers uh, say in the 20. 19, 2020, uh, they said uh, that uh, uh, RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is based on the basis of ASEAN Plus 6, that's uh, China's uh, project. Well, it is not really uh, the case. I mean, the, the ASEAN Plus 6, was, as I explained now, uh, there was a Japan's proposal uh, in 2006, and um, uh, tried to bring in uh, Australia, New Zealand, and India into the picture. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, India stepped down from RCEP. RCEP stands for Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement on the basis of ASEAN Plus 6. But unfortunately, uh, India stepped down. Why? Because, uh, well, you know, uh, India is or India has been very preoccupied with uh, influx of uh, Chinese proposal when India dismantled uh, all the uh, duties. So uh, uh, they wanted to, uh, to protect their domestic industries uh, from the tsunami of uh, uh, Chinese produ products getting into Indian market, uh, thanks to uh, our SAP uh, you know, tariff scrap exercise. So you see, uh, we understand the Indians' uh, concern, but still, 
uh, India uh, would have chance to come back to RCEP, uh, particularly now uh, the RCEP countries, uh, 15 of them, has a special sort of framework to uh, uh, bring back uh, India to, to th this framework of RCEP. Uh, it's up to India whether they accept or not. Uh, but for the time being, uh, without India. So TPP minus US, RCEP minus India. You see, that is the situation. We have also Japan, China, Korea, uh, JCK, uh, EPA under negotiations. And JCK is uh, certainly the part of ASEAN plus six or RCEP. Uh, but we haven't had this uh, uh, trilateral EPA established yet. The day before yesterday, I was participating in the seminar uh, in Seoul, again, uh, by Zoom, it was online, and uh, many participants uh, coming from China and uh, uh, Republic of Korea, the South Korea, uh, they were mentioning this uh, JCK. Uh, you know, um, since RCEP came into force already as of uh, January the 1st this year, uh, Japan is not really sticking its too much importance to JCK because uh, within the framework of uh, uh, RCEP, uh, Japanese uh, export, uh, duty-free export to China would increase from some 80% level to 86% over time. Uh, and also in the case of Japan export to Korea, it's uh, something like 18% range to uh, 92% uh, that will be covered by duty-free trade, uh, thanks to RCEP. So, uh, you know, in Japan, we do not really regard JCK indispensable. Uh, we are more interested in uh, enhancing TPP. But it was interesting that uh, both Chinese and Korean participants, experts on trade, they mentioned this JCK and uh, they should accelerate uh, the completion of negotiation with JCK. It was interesting sort of uh, uh, observation that I had. Well, and uh, beyond regional FTA APAs, uh, the TPP, that's uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, originally, uh, you know, United States was in, so altogether 12 countries. So if the United States was there, uh, the coverage of TPP in the world GDP was uh, almost 38%, nearly 40% of world GDP covered by TPP, including United States. But after United States departure, the CPTPP, we call that uh, the uh, comprehensive and progressive TPP, or more simply TPP-11, covers only 14 to 15% of world GDP. So, uh, you know, the U.S. departure caused a fairly substantive uh, sort of shrinking of the size of TPP. But anyway, uh, Japan worked very hard to keep uh, TPP alive. And we, go, we have the comprehensive and uh, progressive TPP with 11 countries. Uh, and uh, uh, that was uh, really the Japanese efforts to keep TPP results alive. Uh, you know, so that was kind of turning point for, uh, for Japan uh, to be uh, playing the more important role and more proactive role uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the making of uh, trade architecture uh, in, uh, across the Asia Pacific. Now we have CPTPP, TPP 11, to keep momentum of trade liberalism in the aftermath of uh, the US departure uh, from the TPP. Uh, so this TPP 11 also in, in force in December uh, 2018. So we have the TPP 11 uh, in force since December 2018. And uh, now uh, China, uh, as well as Taiwan, interesting enough, those uh, two uh, parties are interested in uh, joining uh, CPTPP. They placed a formal request uh, for uh, accession. And uh, also England, uh, I mean, the UK uh, made application and uh, uh, they are already in the uh, negotiation phase with the 11 members of the TPP. So uh, most probably uh, UK will be the first 
uh, additional uh, member to TPP-11. Uh, then it will be followed by uh, maybe China, Taiwan, and so forth. Um, so you see, that is the situation. So we have TPP and we have RCEP, which came into force uh, January the 1st this year. So uh, we have you know, two of them uh, across Asia, East Asia, or Asia Pacific. And we, in addition, we have Japan EU, that is uh, quite important, uh, as I mentioned. So this is a list. Uh, don't you think it is rather uh, impressive? <laughs> Uh, because you see, when I was uh, uh, in Geneva, uh, you know, uh, when uh, Noel Batista was uh, ambassador of Brazil, uh, defending Brazilian interest, uh, that was uh, late uh, second half of 1980s when we were uh, negotiating in the Uruguay round. Uh, Japan, because of the agricultural sensitivity, Japan could not play the very important role as, uh, uh, you know, liberal trade, but uh, now we have uh, more than 18 bilateral EPAs uh, and uh, we are the, uh, uh, engaged in the CPTPP, it's a plurilateral or if you like multilateral uh, mega FTA. We have also RCEP and so forth. So you see the, uh, for someone like myself, you know, who knew the, uh, the old history of uh, agriculture protectionism in the 1970s, 80s, uh, uh, even uh, the second, uh, first half of 1990s, uh, it is quite phenomenal. Uh, it's like a dream for us that we have now EPA, free trade agreement with the EU. Can you believe that? Uh, we have, uh, although it's limited to uh, only on goods, but we have also free trade agreement with the United States. Uh, we enjoy those, uh, you know, bilateral EPAs in addition to the mega FDA. So it, it is quite uh, uh, impressive. You see, I'm very, uh, I'm very happy to see this. Uh, Japan could lead uh, trade liberalism uh, for the rest of the 21st century. I hope. Um, so this is the uh, very simple sort of. Uh, picture of uh, EPA, Japan's FDA. Uh, so FDA, the main element, uh, which is market access and trading goods and services, of course, that's in the central part of our economic partnership agreement. But in the EPA, uh, in addition to market access, we have a government procurement uh, chapter. We have also chapter on the movement of natural persons. Now, uh, under which, for instance, uh, in the, our bilateral uh, EPA with the Philippines, with, the, uh, with Indonesia, uh, with Vietnam, uh, their uh, nurses and uh, uh, care workers can come into Japan and work uh, as a nurse or uh, care, uh, care workers in Japanese uh, hospitals and uh, uh, elderly care centers. So you see, that's also part of uh, you know the agreement uh, of this chapter of movement of natural persons. We have also competition policy coordinations. Uh, we have chapter on business environment after the investment has been done in order to ameliorate uh, the situation uh, of the business uh, in the host country. Uh, the business environment uh, chapter uh, provides a very solid basis for. Uh, consultations uh, for uh, enhancing business on either side. Uh, we have bilateral cooperation is also part of EPA. And most importantly, we have chapter on investment. And uh, most of the uh, bilateral EPAs, we have uh, uh, ISDS. ISDS stands for the Investor versus State uh, Dispute Settlement, ISDS. So with the exception of only one or two, one of them is uh, uh, bilateral EPA with the Philippines, uh, where we don't have ISDS, uh, but the, uh, uh, we have uh, ISDS with the rest of the uh, uh, EPA with ASEAN neighbors, and um, uh, also in the CPTPP. Uh, so invest investment uh, chapter, uh, we consider that was a, a major achievement uh, together with uh, duty-free access uh, of goods uh, 
uh, in our EPAs. Uh, this one cover shows uh, somewhat uh, the uh, uh, coverage of those uh, different elements in trading goods, services, investment, other things uh, in uh, each of those bilateral uh, EPAs. Um, the membership, uh, economic importance of regional integration of the days, much earlier days, uh, when we started our negotiation, like 2011 or 2012, uh, that was the pr proportion of the uh, trade and also GDP. Uh, on your left-hand side, we have the different uh, members, uh, membership of different uh, um, architecture uh, or frameworks, if you like. Uh, as you see, uh, we have TPP 11 there, and we have our CEP, uh, which is ASEAN, uh, 10 nations of ASEAN plus Japan, China, Korea, plus Australia, New Zealand. Now India uh, has opted out. So India is out uh, from this picture. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's interesting to see uh, there is a kind of overlapping uh, membership, as you know, between uh, RCEP and TPP. Uh, those four countries like Singapore, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Brunei, those uh, four of uh, 10 ASEAN nations are the members to TPP. And uh, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, those three developed uh, country members to uh, RCEP also uh, constitute uh, TPP together with USA, Peru, Chile, Canada, and Mexico, you see. So uh, those seven countries uh, in RCEP, uh, you know, they would uh, play the very important uh, pivotal, uh, pivotal role uh, in promoting uh, free air trade and free air flow of investment, uh, you know, coming, uh, borrowing the idea from TPP and implementing in RCEP, and hopefully uh, other countries uh, like uh, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand will join uh, TPP one day when they are ready to join. So you see the, uh, the relationship between TPP and RCEP or CPTPP and RCEP uh, could be uh, complementary rather than, uh, rather than uh, you know, uh, uh, contradictory, I would say, you know. So, uh, of course, you know, some political uh, implications uh, there, I have to admit, like uh, China's association or Chinese uh, participation in the TPP uh, could be a very political agenda, particularly when uh, Taiwan is also uh, requesting uh, its membership in TPP. So we have geopolitical uh, issues involved there. But, uh, uh, you know, very fact that uh, seven countries uh, of our set are the uh, members to TPP, that would create a more uh, kind of comfortable situation for others like Indonesia, Philippines, uh, and Korea. So are okay uh, to, uh, you know, join TPP uh, in, in due course. Well, um, I think time goes by very quickly. Uh, so. 10, uh, oh, it's 9.38, so uh, I have to uh, uh, maybe get into wrap, wrapping up sort of uh, phase. So this is, uh, you know, the TPP uh, in nutshell, uh, the very high duty elimination ratio. But new rules, uh, we have state-owned enterprises, uh, regular, the chapter on SOE. Uh, this is uh, uh, to... Uh, uh, deal with the regulations on non-commercial assistance by government. Uh, of course, you see uh, state-owned enterprises uh, here and there. Uh, you, even in uh, Singapore, uh, like Tamasek is a huge Singaporean SOE. Uh, so it's uh, not only Vietnam, but also other countries like uh, Malaysia as well. Uh, but SOEs has a very uh, significant meaning because when China uh, tried to join uh, CPTPP, SOEs would be uh, maybe one of the difficult uh, sort of uh, challenge for them if they really seriously want to join the TPP. Uh, labor and environment, uh, those are also very important issues, and they are subject to dispute settlement. And uh, for China, it would be, again, uh, huge uh, 
you know, challenge uh, when they want to join the TPP. Government procurement, uh, China has been struggling to join the WTO government procurement agreement, but uh, so far it has not been uh, uh, completed. So uh, government procurement also uh, will be a very uh, significant sort of barrier for uh, China. Um, that was already the agreement uh, already made and signed uh, in earlier days before Mr. Trump came into the power. Withdrew from the TPP and China uh, took advantage of that. Uh, and uh, they uh, also lose uh, uh, incentives to enhance FTAs. Uh, but now uh, they have the Belt and Road Initiatives and making full use of AIIB, uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, as well as the BRICS Bank, so that market economy principles are in a difficult situation, uh, being threatened, and major crisis uh, that will cause uh, for the free trade and free democracy in the region. So um, TPP minus US, TPP 11, or CPTPP uh, should pursue uh, as the temperate uh, all for the 21st century uh, trade rules across the region of Asia Pacific. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, let us continue. Uh, how does Japan deal with uncertainties? A proactive approach uh, towards more integrated and open market across Asia Pacific and beyond, um, enhanced connectivity via EPAs. So uh, the, this is the uh, very uh, descriptive uh, uh, chronology uh, of the TPP-11. Um, the, uh, that was uh, uh, signed uh, in Chile in March 2018, and uh, that came into force uh, at the end of, uh, the, that was December 2018. Uh, we have uh, Japan-US trade talks. Uh, we have several uh, track record of uh, negotiations like uh, Vice Prime Minister Aso and the Vice President Pence. Uh, they, are, they were engaged in the economic dialogue, uh, following, uh, follow, following, uh, followed by uh, FFR. This is uh, uh, free, fair, and reciprocal trade talks uh, uh, started uh, in April 2018. So we have some background, uh, kind of preparative uh, stages uh, for the bilateral talks uh, in the uh, uh, in the trade in goods, uh, why we needed that? Because uh, although we, Japan and US agreed upon in the framework of TPP already uh, back in 2015, but since the US uh, you know left uh, TPP, uh, so in order to just ensure that the uh, what the US got uh, never uh, 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 will not be lost. Uh, so just, you know, the uh, Japan-US bilateral talks to make sure that what the US got uh, and what Japan got from bilateral uh, trade deals under uh, TPP would be uh, just assured. And that agreement came into force uh, two years ago, January 1st, 2020. Uh, this is an uh, interesting uh, sort of Thing. It's about joint statement. It was a typical case of a diplomatic paper out exercise. Uh, uh, you can just take a look at that. Uh, uh, yes, uh, we needed that kind of uh, diplomatic uh, sort of uh, uh, paper out uh, exercise uh, uh, to deal with uh, Mr. Trump. Now, this is the uh, kind of uh, picture to show you again the. Uh, uh, ASEAN members, uh, sorry, the uh, RCEP membership and uh, TPP. And RCEP is very much uh, ASEAN centered uh, FTA network. So ASEAN has been a kind of uh, 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 platform to receive Japanese investment, Korean investment, and Chinese investment. So uh, uh, in that sense, uh, ASEAN people like to say that uh, ASEAN is uh, sitting in the uh, uh, driver's seat uh, for RCEP. And maybe uh, it is uh, quite true. Uh, 
So you see the uh, uh, ASEAN is, uh, is a kind of uh, cornerstone of uh, uh, those East Asian uh, economic integrations. Um, this is uh, also quite uh, uh, interesting sort of uh, uh, movement of goods and services. Uh, but here, for instance, on your right hand side, the bottom part, the example one, the Japanese automobile company based in Thailand imports uh, engines and transmissions from Japan, uh, assembles them in Thailand and exports from uh, uh, Thailand to Australia. Uh, that is uh, the kind of, uh, you know, the uh, supply uh, chain and uh, export destinations. Example three is about the elevator. Japanese elevator manufacturer, that's Mitsubishi Heavy Industry, based in Thailand, uh, imports hoists from China, uh, manufactures uh, elevators in Thailand and exports uh, them to India. So you see the... Uh, those countries, this, uh, including India, 16 countries have been very much involved in a uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, de facto business driven integration, but now they are more solid because of the uh, uh, institutions of uh, uh, RCEP uh, and uh, all the bilateral agreements that they have so far uh, concluded. So, um, this is a, a kind of uh, my idea that I want to show you uh, from starting this project, starting from the left hand side to the right. Uh, Japan's EPA uh, already co concluded uh, more than 15 of them. Uh, then uh, two uh, directions one is uh, around, around East Asia, that's RCEP, and uh, going down to the Pacific Rim. Pacific Rim, we have TPP and Japan, US. And Japan uh, is uh, enjoying the uh, membership both to RCEP and TPP, and also Japan, uh, Japan US is a bilateral one with the United States. So uh, the RCEP is more, uh, you know, the integration oriented approach. And uh, we have uh, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar and uh, to some extent Vietnam as well, they are the latecomers uh, in ASEAN. So those four latecomers, uh, particularly Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, they are lagging behind in terms of the economic uh, development stage. So uh, um, RCEP is very much to, uh, uh, to uh, include uh, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar on the way to uh, economic uh, development or economic prosperity. So it's uh, very much uh, derived by the inclusive growth type of philosophy. While uh, TPP is more uh, advanced country approach, higher level market access, almost 100% in the manufactured products, even for agriculture, 97%. Uh, so it's a high level uh, market access and uh, lose, uh, Interesting enough that RCEP and TPP share, uh, you know, the common uh, rule uh, negotiations, be it uh, intellectual properties, uh, TBT, uh, technical barriers to trade, or, you know, other things like uh, uh, e-commerce and so forth. But the depth, the depth of uh, content of the rules are very different. TPP is very, very deep. RCEP is much shallower. So, uh, uh, you know, the uh, RCEP is, uh, is the, the uh, uh, framework where those uh, developing countries, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, they are involved. So, uh, although they negotiate uh, quite similar uh, rules, such as uh, intellectual properties, such as uh, competition policies uh, or e-commerce, the degree of the uh, uh, so mandatory uh, obligations uh, is much, much lighter, much shallower, uh, whereas in uh, TPP is more stringent and more uh, kind of rigid uh, so there, there is a, a difference between, in terms of, uh, you know, the uh, uh, 
you know, the CBMS of the, of the rules. Um, so some countries like Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, uh, they are still uh, rather difficult for them to join uh, TPP. But look, already Vietnam is in. So uh, that is not impossible. Uh, but nevertheless, they have the philosophy of inclusive growth. So uh, maybe it takes time. Uh, so, you know, the situation, uh, the, the relation between RCEP and TPP would be uh, quite sequential. Uh, so some countries like uh, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, when they feel they are ready to uh, join TPP, uh, they would uh, be engaged in the bilateral uh, negotiation within the framework of TPP, and uh, they could join uh, if all the uh, conditions were met. Uh, so in this way, this, uh, there is a kind of sequence. You see, the, those uh, members in RCEP, when they are ready, they can come to TPP. So maybe, you know, uh, to what extent uh, you are uh, familiar with baseball, but uh, in the U.S. baseball, they, we have... Uh, major league and minor league. And the TPP would be considered as a major league and uh, RCEP would be minor league. So um, in the minor league, uh, you know, those young uh, baseball players, uh, they can exercise, they can also engage in the games. And when they sh show uh, their, uh, their results and they could always, uh, you know, uh, join uh, the major league uh, when all the conditions are met. You see, so uh, that kind of thing, you see, the RCEP and TPP is a kind of sequential sort of relations. It's not in the conflict. Okay, uh, so the, well, the message that, that I'd like to uh, uh, send today is uh, the importance of uh, multilateralizing those regionalism. Uh, in the case of uh, East Asia, we have uh, several uh, mega FTAs. So, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, the, all the rules negotiated in the different mega FTAs could be converged and bring them back to, uh, to the uh, multilateral trading uh, negotiations uh, under WTO. So it's a new uh, momentum uh, to be created to reinforce the trade multilateralism embodied in the WTO. Uh, rules uh, such as in the digital trade rules, uh, uh, or WTO reforms uh, that uh, could be uh, discussed with uh, uh, much wider uh, participation of like-minded countries. So uh, on the basis of those uh, mega FTAs and all bilateral EPAs, FTAs, we could make uh, uh, critical mass even larger with uh, uh, more uh, like-minded countries altogether. So in that context, uh, uh, Brazil and other Mercosur countries uh, is very important. Uh, Japan and Mercosur countries should work together to strengthen the WTO system. Uh, you know, I mentioned about Ambassador uh, Batista. I respect very much when I was in uh, the early 30s uh, when the Uruguay round negotiation had been taking place. And I had very high esteem and respect to uh, Brazilian delegation they negotiated very, very well. Um, so, you know, uh, with that quality, I think Brazil uh, could make a big contribution uh, to the strengthening of the uh, WTO uh, in its totality of system. Uh, Mercosur countries uh, constitute the last remaining piece of jigsaw puzzle uh, in terms of Japanese EPAs. Uh, so that means that uh, uh, Japan is, uh, and Japanese uh, industries, uh, Keidan Ren, uh, they already uh, published their uh, report uh, that they are interested in having uh, EPA with uh, medical suit countries. So that's why I said medical suit countries uh, is a last remaining piece of jigsaw puzzle after the uh, all the uh, EPAs that so far Japan has achieved. So in this sense, you see the, uh, we have uh, three mega regions. One is Europe centered around the EU, and we have Americas. The, now we have uh, USMCA almost embracing, not completely though, uh, or NAFTA. We have Mercosur, uh, Brazil is uh, 
the major part of Mercosur. Uh, we have Alianza del Pacifico, and across the East Asia and uh, Americas, we have uh, APEC as an informal, uh, non-binding uh, forum for uh, trade facilitations, uh, trade liberalization as well. Uh, but we have now TPP, uh, CPTPP to be more precise. And between Europe and the EU and East Asia, we have Japan EU EPA. Uh, TTIP uh, remains to be seen, but uh, as far as uh, East Asia or Japan is concerned, we have TPP, we have Japan EU, and within East Asia, we have ARSA. So you see, uh, what we need is perhaps a bilateral link between uh, Japan and Mercosur so that. Uh, East Asia and uh, Latin America would become a much closer partner. And uh, I hope that Mercosur countries will be gradually integrated into the uh, uh, global value chain centered around uh, East Asia. See, uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, South American continent, uh, the uh, uh, Andes mountain range is a kind of uh, uh, watershed, right? The, uh, on the Pacific side, the, all those countries uh, uh, joining in, joined in the Alianza del Pacifico, they are the members to CPTPP or bilateral EPA with Japan, uh, with the exception of Colombia. Colombia has been negotiating for quite some time, but it hasn't reached the completion of the uh, agreement. Uh, but uh, the other side of Andes uh, mountain range, that the uh, Atlantic side of coastline countries like uh, Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, uh, only Uruguay has bilateral uh, investment agreement. Uh, so I think you know uh, we need uh, to uh, strengthen the tie uh, between Japan and Mercosur. Uh, hope that. Mercosur also, uh, you know, become ready uh, to uh, get into the formal uh, negotiations. So, concluding remarks is, uh, you know, uh, TPP twelve is a temperate uh, for twenty first century uh, golden standard, as uh, Hillary said. Uh, CPTPP to keep momentum for freer trade in Asia Pacific. RCEP for updating the production network in East Asia. It's keep updating. Japan EU EPA, the major inter regional Omega FTA, uh, connecting East Asia and the EU uh, Japan. So, if uh, we could uh, reach Japan Mercosur EPA, and that could be possible, uh, the, it's a uh, connecting uh, FTA EPA between East Asia and uh, Mercosur countries. So, um, all together, all together, we should not forget about the importance of WTO. Uh, to maintain a strength in trade and multilateralism in the WTO. So that's the, uh, my uh, uh, conclusion. Uh, let us uh, enhance further the predictability uh, for international business. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of my expose. Sorry for uh, being so long. Uh, maybe uh, it's, a, it's the effect of my uh, sleep, <laughs> so sleepy sort of, uh, body condition. Sorry for that. Uh, thank you very much. Professor Watanabe, we thank you for your complete and very interesting lecture. I uh, would like to seize advantage to, to ask you uh, some questions. The first yes. question would be, mm. because of the pandemic, many governments increased their level of indebtedness it injected massive monetary stimulus in their economies. As a consequence, inflation became a problem and many central banks, especially the Fed, have raised interest rates. In your analysis, will this tendency affect the global recovery? Yes, uh, it would. Uh, it would. Uh... Uh, effect uh, and it has certain uh, adverse effects uh, on the world recovery, uh, certainly. And now, because of the uh, uh, Ukrainer, uh, you know, uh, uh, issue, the war in Ukraine, uh, all the prices, uh, prices uh, not only of petroleum but also the food stuff, um, all kinds of things uh, now uh, going up. 
and uh, that is a uh, uh, rather bad inflation. Uh, you know, the it's uh, 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 induced by the uh, uh, price increase in uh, those imported products. So uh, that would affect uh, all countries. It's affecting Japan already. Uh, it would affect all the countries, uh, but maybe the countries uh, of the southern hemisphere, um, the countries in Africa, uh, they would be very harshly uh, affected. So um, uh, that could uh, result in uh, very severe sort of uh, setbacks in uh, uh, economic uh, recovery uh, in the in the months to come. So for for that purpose, again, I'd like to uh, emphasize, I should like to emphasize that uh, the trade liberalization uh, is very important uh, because trade liberalization certainly has the effect to uh, lower uh, the price, in, uh, price increase. So uh, I think, uh, you know, all the countries should work together in bona fide uh, and um, work together to uh, bring the uh, prices in, uh, down to the reasonable level. Uh, so that is, uh, uh, I think your your uh, point is very relevant, and we have to bear in mind the importance of that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. We have a second question here. Uh, the automotive industry is one of the world's largest industry by revenue, with the highest spending on research and development. Mm -hmm. In recent time, this market has become more competitive with the mm -hmm. entrance of new players and more dynamic with the transition to greener sources of energy and electrical vehicles. Exactly. But how is Japan adapting to the future? How could the partnership between Japan and Mercosur be incremented in order to stimulate the modernization of our automotive manufacturing plants. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you very much for this uh, very important and penetrating question. Um, since Brazil uh, produces, uh, you know, the ethanol, uh, it's a new type of uh, uh, fuels, and uh, in that sense, Brazil could lead, uh, you know, some uh, technologies related to. Uh, the uh, uh, new type of vehicles uh, in the future. Uh, Japanese uh, companies uh, have been making a lot of efforts. Uh, Toyota, for instance, uh, has been uh, rather uh, putting uh, uh, strength on the uh, uh, hybrid uh, cars, but now they are uh, more, uh, you know, uh, changing and putting the gear into uh, electric vehicles. Uh, the, the change uh, of Toyota that uh, all the observers have been very much surprised. So uh, once Toyota has been decided, uh, their move is very quick. Uh, but for the electric vehicles, uh, we need to have good source of uh, uh, materials for the battery. And in that sense, um, the uh, uh, Japan's uh, uh, stable uh, relation, uh, the bilateral relation with China, uh, would be very primordially important. Uh, uh, and also other uh, countries who are producing the, uh, uh, all the uh, uh, rare metals, um, uh, in, uh, which is uh, all the rare metals that are needed in the making of uh, electric vehicles. So again, uh, I would like to emphasize that the uh, free flow of uh, uh, goods and services uh, with the uh, like-minded countries, very important. In that context, uh, RCEP uh, already made a great uh, sort of uh, uh, progress. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the duty-free uh, export of Japan uh, increased uh, from 8% to uh, some 82% uh, or so uh, in terms of the uh, uh, goods uh, to be covered by duty-free uh, export and also the other way around uh, from China to Japan. So it's uh, this, this way, you know, the win-win uh, 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 type of arrangement uh, in RCEP or maybe possibly 
uh, when China would be ready to negotiate its C uh, CPTPP uh, uh, adhesions uh, membership, uh, that would be also another opportunity for Japan to negotiate uh, safer, uh, you know, source of uh, uh, materials uh, that would be needed for electric vehicles. So that's uh, kind of uh, uh, my answer to your uh, your questions, your second question. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I think that we have one last question. Mm -hmm. The current conflicts are stressing many global logistical chains, especially those concerning energy and food security. Mm. Established in 1979, Prodesir, Japanese-Brazilian Cooperation Program for Development of the Cerrados has mm -hmm. rev revolutionized the soybean production in Brazil. Mm -hmm. How can mm -hmm. Brazil and Japan cooperate in their responses to the new challenges of energy and food security? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, for both energy security and food security, uh, we uh, look at uh, the possibility of uh, uh, EPA uh, with uh, Mercosur as a kind of key element in the future. Uh, not only, uh, you know, uh, very important source of uh, agriculture uh, staff uh, in Brazil, but also uh, the uh, very rich agriculture uh, uh, output of Argentina uh, also uh, attract uh, Japanese attention very much. Uh, what is important for Japan is diversify uh, diversify the source of supply of both energy products and food. So uh, that constitutes energy security as well as uh, food security. So for both purposes, um, I think the uh, Japan should seek uh, further progress uh, in making uh, Japan Mercosur EPA uh, realized in the very near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Well, we are about to finish our meeting today, and I would like first to, uh, to invite you uh, to address your final remarks, if you wish, and sure, then the sure. final remarks after you from Ambassador Hayashi. I see, I see. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's been a great honor uh, and pleasure uh, for me to be appearing on uh, uh, your uh, fund, uh, your foundation, and uh, um, I hope uh, that I could renew my face-to-face uh, -face contact uh, once uh, COVID-19 would be more uh, somewhat uh, under control, and hope that I could come and see you again. But in the meantime, uh, you know, let us uh, walk together. Uh, though there is a distance, but uh, uh, Japan and Brazil have a very uh, special uh, sort of link uh, between us. Uh, so uh, let us uh, walk together very closely uh, for the betterment uh, of bilateral relations as well as for the betterment of the world welfare. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. And uh, the floor is back to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Watanabe, uh, for your uh, final remarks. And I would like to, to hear uh, the Ambassador Hayashi. Um, Ambassador, the floor is yours for your final remarks. Well, thank you very much. I just I'd like to commend the first uh, Professor Watanabe for this uh, very enlightening and comprehensive uh, uh, remarks or, or explanation on the Thank Japanese uh, economic policy strategy. Uh, I think it's very, I, I hope that it was very helpful for all listeners and all participants uh, to consider further our economic uh, relations between Japan and Brazil. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous uh, remark, I consider that the Japan Brazil has a huge potential mm -hmm. uh, to strengthen the, uh, our economic relations mm -hmm. and the, the, and strengthen our economic partnership as well. 
and we have um, uh, so so it, it, I just arrived in uh, Brasilia f- uh, three months and a half ago, and mm-hmm. the uh, further economic uh, partnership between two countries is one of my main challenges. Yes. And the, uh, so so I'd like to do my best uh, to well the, uh, to enhance our relations in this economic area. And also, I expect to have uh, Professor Watanabe again here in Brasilia uh, to have further well, the presidential contact with uh, Brazilian partners. And the, I think uh, now we, Japan is opening more the uh, uh, frontiers and the, uh, we are relaxing our uh, uh, border measures uh, against COVID-19. So I think uh, this is the uh, uh, mm. prox- next event we have uh, receiving Mr. Watanabe here. And the, so, so just I'd like to thank you again for today's online event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for, for your final remarks. Well, I, in the name of uh, Alexandre de Guzman Foundation and our president, uh, Ambassador mm-hmm. Marcel Loreiro, I would like once again to thank Professor Watanabe for his brilliant lecture that was delivered today and our audience for watching. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado a todos e até uma próxima edição. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. Até logo. Ambassador, thank you very much.